Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is a pleasure to be with you today. For those of you that may not know, my name is Dustin Pruitt. Uh, I get the privilege of leading the Winchmore Hill location of the Restore family of churches. Uh, and it's also my pleasure to be with you today, continuing on in our series of Exodus. And so I'm going to continue on today. We're going to be talking about living in contested spaces. Now, I'm not usually one to give the, the, the title of a message in the very beginning or even give it a title to begin with, but I kind of want that in your mind from the get-go because I'm going to read some scripture. I'm going I'm to read a, a good portion of the passage, so keep that in your mind. Living in a contested space. Now, obviously, this is from thousands of years ago, but I think us today, we live in contested spaces. Now, that's the preview. So here we go. I'm going to be starting in Exodus chapter 1, verse 7. I'm going to jump forward and then I'm going to jump to chapter 2. So it says verse 7 of chapter 1, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Now, the Israelites just so happened to also be slaves of Egypt this time. So for about three centuries, they had been in slavery. That's your great, 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 great grandparents' time. So these stories of Abraham, Jacob, who became Israel, Joseph. These are, these are so long ago. The stories of God intervening and blessing His people are so long ago. They've been in bondage in a contested space for centuries. But here they are, they're multiplying. They, they soon turn out to outnumber the Egyptians themselves. So I'm picking up in verse 11. So they put slave masters over them, the Egyptians, to the Israelites, to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So even though they're in this oppression, God is with them. God is with them, blessing them enlarging the family. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. They feared them and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So yet though God may be with them, they're living situation. They're living in a contested space. It is not easy. It picks up in verse 15. The king of Egypt, the pharaoh of this time, said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were, uh, please, always, I always ask for forgiveness before I'm getting into to biblical names and their pronunciations. So if, if you, all the, the Bible scholars at home, please have grace in your heart. But it's uh, Shifra, and Pua were the name of the midwives. He says to them, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? I don't get it. I, I give you a command. I'm Pharaoh, right? I'm Pharaoh, right? The, the, I, I didn't make sure I didn't forget he's asking around. I gave you a command. Why didn't you follow it? And the Hebrew women, once again, knowing and fearing God and not fearing Pharaoh, said to them, whoa, 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 easy, Pharaoh. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. Well, before we and my, my fellow midwives can even get in there, the babies are born. And so skirting kind of the letter of the law of like, you said when the babies are born, if it's a boy who's striking dead. Well, they're, they're already born. It's, it's, 
it's hours later. So that command doesn't really apply anymore. And so in verse 20, it says, So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased. The, the, the Hebrew people, the, the family, the chosen people of God continue to grow and grow and grow. And it says, uh, it became even more numerous. And because the midwives fear God, he gave them families of their own. Verse 22, then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but every girl live. So, okay, okay. Boy pops out uh, on the birthing stool. You're not there to follow the command? Fine. It doesn't matter if it's the birthing stool or not. Now those babies got to go in the Nile. Those babies are, are now crocodile food. Talk about a rough situation. The, the centuries of slavery, the, the ruthless, the Bible said ruthless multiple times there. The harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly, made their lives bitter. That's their reality. It is not sunshine and day. We are God's chosen people. There's rainbows in the sky. There's food popping up out of the ground, raining manna from heaven. That's yet to come. It's not that for them. But God is with them, and they knew that God had the authority. Pharaoh can say all these things, but it lies with Lives with the Creator. Now we're here in chapter 2, picking up in verse 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for, for three months. But when he, she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch, you know, waterproofed it. Uh, then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Uh, the, the boy, the baby's sister, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter, the, the water takes the, the little uh, papyrus cradle, waterproofed down the river. Then the Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave to go get it a slave, a Hebrew woman, to go pick up this Hebrew baby. She opened it, saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. And she said, this is one of the Hebrew babies. And she, she eventually takes him into the house uh, and raises this young child, as we know, to be Moses. So let's kind of get into there. Living in a contested space. Now, I want to give you a, a quick uh, some of these examples I'm going to give are very light and fluffy when there are some very real world nitty gritty things we'll, we might get into. But we all live in contested spaces. Guess what? The Bible says it that we are in the world, not of the world. That we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, but we're also, we, we live, for many of us, here in the UK. And so we live in a contested space. The kingdom of heaven, there is no contest. But we live in the broken world, contested spaces. Let me give you an example of my contested space. Two weeks ago, I went and saw Dune 2 with my wife and was fully blown away. I mean, a, a masterpiece of filmmaking, of audio production, of, of art direction, of editing, of lighting, of acting. Every piece of that film is exquisitely made. And it, the story also happens to be pretty good. And I walk out with my wife and I'm like, oh my gosh, aren't you so, like, that was a masterpiece. Can you believe what you just witnessed? And she said, it was all right. Excuse me. It was all right? It was, it was all right? And I could fear or feel in me something right. 
it was all right. And so on our whole journey home and these past two weeks, I've lived in a contested space and I'm living with somebody who is blind to reality, blind to what they witness that basically it was, <laughs> I'm you know, hyperbolic here, but divinity touched film in, D <laughs> in Dune 2. And I'm living with somebody that doesn't understand that. And that we, we can't think the same. That she doesn't see what's just so painfully obvious. That it's right there on the screen. It's in the text. That I have to be side by side with somebody that doesn't see and know what I know. And therefore, their behavior doesn't follow what I know. Do you kind of start? I hope you saw the parallel long ago. But the same thing with us. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are God's chosen people, his sons and daughters, part of a royal priesthood now. And so you now live in a contested space. If you didn't know it, I I'm telling you now, you live in a contested space. The people surrounding you, maybe at your job, maybe at your hobby, maybe in your family, it's a contested space. So let's somewhat go into that a bit. That the enemy's plan was to destroy the, the Israelites' hope. Was to break their spirit. That to pile on and pile on and pile on. And sometimes we're in a place where it just feels like I can't take another pile. It's much too much. Could you take this burden from me? The next straw will break this camel's back. But let's follow the example of the Israelites in this moment. That they knew who God was. They had stories of their ancestors. Though they were long ago, they knew that God from long ago was still the same God today. Just like for us, we know the God that's in the Bible is out of the Bible with us here today. That their hope rested in God. It didn't rest in Pharaoh changing his mind. It didn't rest in that taskmaster uh, being sick that day. So, oh, whew, I get to take a load off today. Their hope was in the Lord. And, and the Bible talks about fear, that they feared God. The, the Bible, uh, in the book of Proverbs says that fearing the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Or is the beginning of wisdom, other translations have said. That if we know who God is, and that's not like I'm trembling in fright of who God is. It's knowing that God is the creator of the universe, that he spoke and there was light. He spoke and there was the planet. He spoke, there's animals. That his words alone carry so much power. This Pharaoh is nothing. That they didn't fear because they knew who God was. And so thing, the same thing with us. When we're in our contested space, usually when we're pushing up against something, a, a natural flesh human response can be fear. Of it feels like I'm being attacked, though you are sometimes. Many times in these contested spaces, whether they know it or not, it's an attack. And so we respond in fear to attack back. You know, uh, that there's the uh, fight or flight response. There, there's actually three. There's fight, flight, or freeze. 
um, the fight response when you come to, and so we attack back. But the problem is, uh, it, an ancient philosopher once said this in a, a, a place far, far away, a time long, long ago is what it's told. Uh, this philosopher's name was uh, Yoda. Um, and Yoda said, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to suffering. Now, and by no means is this uh, biblical wisdom, but I do think that this holds some merit to it. That when we live in a contested space and we're scared of it, not of God, not knowing who God is, but we're scared of the situation, it can build something in us out of our fear that we can respond in anger. I don't, I don't like what's happening here. The, the things those people are doing, they make me uncomfortable. I'm going to throw back at it. The, the changes that are happening in society and culture, I don't like it. It makes me feel uncomfortable, so I'm going to fight. And if you turn on any news channel, you hear people getting stirred up and angry, and because they're living in a contested space, and they're afraid of what's going on. What does this mean for me? And they respond out of that fear and anger. And that ultimately leads to suffering. Suffering for the people around us. Suffering for ourselves. Once again, I know this isn't biblical knowledge, but th this is true. And that how often in these contested spaces, how often in our work relationships, so many times, like I, I worked at a parks department uh, back in America um, where we just, we took care of the parks. We, we picked up rubbish. We made sure the trees were trimmed. We made sure the grass was cut. Uh, just made, everything was pleasant. And I loved that job, it was so nice. But when I would tell my coworkers, oh, you know, I was a, I was a youth pastor before, I wanna be a pastor again, I feel like that's what God's calling me to. And I'm like, God, God, that, that face in the sky, right? That, what do you, that doesn't exist. And then they'd take a swig of their beer or they'd swear up a storm or they'd do whatever, they just didn't understand. They would mock me for my beliefs. And I could have been upset by that of like, I'm being singled out, I'm being made fun of, I'm being attacked. Now I'm not here to pat my own back, but I'm, I'm just trying to use this as an example. Or I could realize they just, they don't know yet. God, can you use me to show them your love? I don't fear whether they like me or not. I don't fear what they think about me. God, I fear what you think about me. God, I fear, are you disappointed in me? That's what I think. That's, that's all I care about. And that's what God's saying here. Is that this fear can whisper in our ears. That it's all going down the drain. It'll never get better. Society is worse and worse and worse. That you're the outcast. That you're the unwanted. Now it's starting to get louder as you listen more and more. It gets louder and louder and louder. But that's not God's plan for us. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Can, can I tell you some other examples, biblically, of people responding out of fear? Now, Adam and Eve, back in the garden, uh, the snake comes along, and he whispers, God's just afraid that you're going to be just like him. If you ate that, if 
you ate that fruit? Oh, well, and they ate the fruit. Abraham and, and Sarah waiting for this promised child. It said, it's, God told Abraham that your descendants will outnumber the stars in the sky. And homie, I'm sorry, that was very American of me. And the guy is in his 70s. No kids. And he just hears God telling him, oh, you're going to have kids, all right. Oh, your descendants a lot. Remember this? And he gets scared. It's like, but, but, but. And so he has a kid with, with their servant. Which led to suffering. And he's listening to that insidious voice when God gave us a spirit of love and self-control. Things those people lacked, the self-control. And so think, the same thing with us. Are we going to respond out of fear or are we going to respond out of love? A loving parent knows, a loving friend knows, you made a mistake. How can I help you? you don't, can I give you a lending hand? Not a wagging finger. Love responds with open, outstretched arms. Fear responds with closed off and pushing away. God's wanting us to somewhat embrace the contested space. Now, I, I, I don't want to make that seem the wrong way, that we're going to live in contested spaces. We should embrace that concept. Let me start there. We should em- not that you should embrace your abuser. Uh, I, as soon as I said that, I, I heard the other sentence in my head. That's not what I mean. We're going to live in contested spaces everywhere we walk into because we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven in the world, not of the world. We are of the kingdom of heaven in the world, a contested space now. But God will deliver us from these spaces, just as he delivered the Israelite people from these spaces. And how does that happen? Again and again, the the Bible, again and again, it's never alone. If you feel alone, if you're in your contested space, and you feel alone, you got to reach out. We are not meant to do this thing alone. Just like the midwives, it names two. Now, these are the chief midwives that are over all the other midwives. It names two. And same thing with Moses being put into the water. He had his mom, his dad, and his sister. Never alone, goes along. It shows up at Pharaoh's daughter's feet. It's Pharaoh's daughter and her servants. Never alone. God never desired for us to be alone, is to be with one another, is to reach out and to ask for a prayer when we need a prayer, to ask for just a shoulder to lean on when we need a shoulder to lean on, a helping hand when we need a helping hand, because we're not meant to do this alone. And it's through that family, it is through others that God will deliver us out of these contested spaces. Deliver us from that is what is dragging us down. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. God is working all things together, together. All these, these, these. I, I'm not an English major. My my wife has a master's degree in English, and so I'm losing not a pronoun. The the those the together of that sentence. It's it's together. It's not just you. God is working all things together for good. 
So let us know that we're going to be in contested spaces. But how do we respond in them? Do we respond out of fear into anger? Or do we respond out of fear of God? The knowledge of God, of who he is and who I am in him. Because those are two different things. Fear and anger or the fear of God, which is a spirit of love and self-control. Which somebody having the fear of God led me here to you today because they showed me God's love and self-control. And that's what he's calling us to to show people His Spirit. So in our spaces, where we're at, let's pray for Him. Right now, we're about to close our eyes, we're about to bow our heads, which might sound very traditional church for you, but I just want to do it. And we're going to pray about these things. And wherever you're at, please reach out to somebody. If you feel like you're not living in a contested space right now. If things are, are, there are moments of sunshine and rainbows. And I, I always sound very kiddy when I say that. But when th- you're feeling that you're living the blessed life, you need to reach out to somebody that's in a contested space. And if you're in one, you need to reach out to get some help. So let's pray right now to God, help us in where we're at and help us to reach out to one another as this great big family you've brought us a part of. Father, we thank you for your word that though it be thousands of years ago, it is true today. The stories, the wisdom, the heart that you have planted in those pages that we get to see who you are today is the same as you were then. That it is your will that makes all things good, to rescue, to to deliver us, but also to be part of that rescuing and delivering of people. Father, I pray for all those out there that feel like they are living a bitter life, that have been worked ruthlessly by the enemy, by people, by the world, by circumstance, whatever it may be. God, that they may know who you are and that their hope rests in you. And that you may guide us to one another. We're not meant to do this whole thing on our own. We're a family. So Father, lead us to those of us that are hurting. Lead us to those of us that are weak, that need some picking up, that need some healing, that need some strength. Let us share your spirit that's in us with them. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for all of it. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, Please tune in next week. We're going to continue on in this Exodus series. I feel like this this is a special one and probably because Exodus is my second favorite book of the Bible, but it's, it's a special one. You definitely want to watch each and every one of these. Uh, so until next time, guys, I'll see you then. Bye.